joining us. I particularly want to thank my colleagues and the public health officials who are with us. And especially want to thank uh, Ms. Community Clovia for volunteering her time to moderate. I was so uh, excited and pleased when she said that she could join us today. I'm so appreciative of everyone on this call because this, as we know, is such a uh, critical issue. To get past this pandemic, we, we, to get our economy working again, to get our children safely back in school, for folks to be safe on the job and about town, we need to get vaccines in arms efficiently and equitably. So as we talk today and hear from you all, please know my or all of our priority is to get more vaccines, to have an efficient and functioning sign up and distribution system, and to make sure that no one, that's no one in our community is left behind. And now, Clovia, Ms. Community, I'll turn it over to you and you can get us underway. All right, thank you so much, Delegate Betsy Carr for allowing me to be a part of this and our senators and members in Virginia's legislative body. And I really do appreciate that. And it's also important with the viewers that are joining us and the constituents from all of the districts to ask the questions to get the right answers from their elected officials. So once again, I'm honored to be here. We have lots of questions and we wanna to get to all of that. So. First and foremost, we would like to introduce to some, and everybody knows him, but just in case they don't, Dr. Danny Avula, how you doing? Great to see you, Community Club. <laughs> well, let me tell everybody a little bit about you. Dr. Danny Avula is director of the Richmond City and Henrico Health Departments and is currently working with the Office of the Governor as the Virginia Vaccine Coordinator for the COVID-19 vaccine distribution process. And we can go on and on and on. So glad you were here. Let's talk about COVID-19. All right. Well, it has been an incredibly intense uh, month and a half of, of vaccinating Virginia. Um, let me give you guys a, just sort of a snapshot of where we're at right now. And, and I think that uh, probably the first thing I'll say is that we've vaccinated uh, just under 1.3 million people across wow. the state as of this morning. So um, some big numbers. I'm going to just share a quick screen with you. If you go to the vdh.virginia.gov website, you can look at all of this information yourself and you'll see here we are 1.298 million doses administered. Um, and there's an interactive map here that'll tell you, depending on what part of the state in, how many folks in each locality have been vaccinated, um, what the stats look like in terms of rates compared with other communities. Uh, and then, you know, on the there's another tab that kind of takes you to some of the details about where where we're at and what was really pretty impressive is that we're over 90% of the first doses that have come into Virginia have gone out. And so that number that continues to uh, churn at a high rate. Uh, we also are not quite to 50% of second doses. And that's an important thing for people to understand because sometimes people ask the question, hey, it sounds like we have a lot of extra doses in Virginia. Where are they and why can't I get to them? Uh, mm -hmm. And so that here's where we break down our second doses. But what it's important to understand is that this is a two dose vaccine. The first yeah. doses um, have to be matched to second doses. And so many of our providers, our health departments, our hospitals, our pharmacies and, and private providers have to have second doses reserved and attached to those folks who got first doses so that we don't leave anybody who wants a second dose hanging. We gotta make sure they have what they need. And so, uh, but but those those numbers look good too. And, and some of you know that, uh, you know, a, a few weeks ago, uh, Virginia was at the bottom of the country statistically. We were 50th out of 50 in terms of the percentage mm -hmm. of doses administered. Um, and I, I want to share with everybody that we are now top 10 in the country in, uh, in both the percentage of doses administered and uh, the number of people in our, in our Virginia's population who have received a dose. There have just been tremendous work by, you'll hear from my amazing colleagues in the Richmond Henrico Health Department who've been a huge part of that push, um, but health departments and health systems and other providers across the state have just been cranking it as far as getting vaccine out. So it's been mm -hmm. great to see. I think the other thing we should um, name for everybody is that that while so much vaccine vaccination is happening, there's still a lot of people who find themselves eligible in stage 1B, which is where we're at right now, but but haven't been able to be vaccinated. And that's caused a lot of frustration throughout communities across the state. Um, so I'll just name this, that right now the entire state is in 1A and 1B. You see this on my screen. Um, 
one A and one B account for about 50% of Virginia's population. And so what that means is that, you know, half the state is eligible, but we're only getting about 130,000 new doses every week for the entire state, which means that, you know, this part of central Virginia, it's probably mm -hmm. somewhere around uh, 10,000 doses when you take all of the localities. But as, as my colleagues will share with you, they've been able to get uh, you know, m more than 5,000 doses out in a single day in some cases. And so the vaccination capacity is really strong. It's going out really quickly. Um, and uh, it will be a long time unless we see drastic improvements in the national supply. Uh, it'll be two to three months before we get through this 1B population. And I just want to kind of break down what is 1B, who is eligible, and, and what does it look like? Uh, the way that communities are distributing vaccine right now, they take about 50% of what they get mm -hmm. and they they target that for the folks who are 65 and over. We know that age is uh, the leading risk factor for severe consequences of COVID. When you look at the data around hospitalization and death, um, the older you are, the higher your risk is. And so getting to that 65 and over population is a real priority. Um, the, the second approach with the other approximately 50% of that vaccine by community is to work through these essential workers in, in the order that you see here. And so um, the, the health departments are really working hard with their partners on the ground. They'll work with local governments to make sure police and fire and hazmat workers are vaccinated, moving to corrections and homeless shelters uh, here in the Richmond area are now working through child cares and teachers. Um, so the, the idea is that they would systematically work through these essential worker groups in the order you've seen here. Now, there's some flexibility because every community is going to handle that at different paces, going to be able to mobilize vaccine to, to different communities. But this is, this is the basic premise that everybody's following. Mm -hmm. And then individuals who are 16 to 64 and have underlying conditions are kind of sprinkled into this as, as able. And, and mm -hmm. um, Amy and, and Ruthie will talk about what Richmond and Henrico's strategy is for that. Again, it differs slightly from district to district. Um, and it's really hard because there are a lot of people who fall into that uh, 16 to 64 with underlying condition uh, category. A couple other things I'll note and, and then hand off is or that uh, the processes for how you actually register and get in line um, have varied from local health department to local health department. Um, and and a, some of the reason for that early on, the local health departments, uh, you know, it made sense. They were planning the events, they were scheduling the events. And when we moved into 1B, uh, that created an impossible situation for local health departments. They were completely overwhelmed um, by the demand that was created by national and state level decisions. And so that has led to, along with moving into 1B much quicker than anybody expected to, you might remember we didn't expect to be here uh, until mid-February when this all started. And instead that happened in mid-January. Um, so as of this coming week, we will have a centralized call center and a centralized pre-registration process, uh, which will allow uh, anybody across the state to call a, a call center. There's, an, there's a, about 750 agents working there, English and Spanish, as well as through third-party translation, about 100 other languages. Uh, it'll be a great way for those who don't have internet access or, or um, aren't, you know, just need help navigating some of these systems to call somebody and get pre-registered. Um, and so uh, we've heard, we've heard those frustrations and complaints from so many folks across Virginia. And so this week, there should be new opportunities for people to get in line. What that doesn't fix is our supply challenge. And so while uh, it, there will be easier ways to to, to get pre-registered uh, to one of the uh, functions that this upgrade will allow is a, uh, a weekly update to let you know that you are still in line and you'll be able to go and check your status to make sure that you're still on the list. Um, but until we see an, a really significant increase in supply, we're still looking at a two to three month horizon to work through that 1B population. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're working hard to bring new vaccine into Virginia. You've heard about CVS maybe coming in this week. Uh, in another week or two, there'll be a separate federal allocation for, for federally qualified health centers. Uh, but we are scraping and clawing for every dose we can from the federal government and moving it really quickly. Again, I can't say enough about what our local health departments and other partners have done to get vaccine out. Uh, so I will stop there. 
<laughs> well, Dr. Avula, thank you so much for that because I get a lot of calls at the radio station in reference to those persons ages 16 to 64 who do have underlying issues. So thank you so much for that. Um, the hotline or the, the actual hotline, if you will, or the registration line, when will that up and be operating? We are anticipating an announcement from the governor's office on that for Wednesday. For Wednesday, next Wednesday. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Ruth Morrison, how are you, Ruth? Hi, Clovia, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Ruth is policy director of the Richmond City and Henrico Health Departments. Prior to joining the local health departments in 2018, Ms. Morrison worked as the chief innovation officer at Sports Backers, a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to develop programs and events designed to inspire people from all corners of Richmond and in the community. So working at both of these health districts, what is the latest? Because I'm getting persons who are over the age of 65, uh, including my mother who's 75, who registered and she hasn't received anything yet. So I know that's, that's a big question from the community to you. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for having me everybody and nice to be with you on this cold and wet day. Um, so the, as Dr. Vula mentioned, um, individuals who qualify for vaccination in this current phase of 1B and combined with our 1A healthcare workers and long-term care facility residents, it's, it's a lot of us. It's half of, of ourselves and our neighbors. It's half of our population. And uh, for our health districts, you know, we're prioritizing those 65 and older um, with a goal of making sure that half of our total allocation, which is limited right now due to the federal supply being limited, but that whatever uh, uh, number of doses we get in in a given week, that half of that goes to our residents and our neighbors 65 years and older. So for people like your mother, Clovia, and, and yeah. her friends, her neighbors, um, you know, that's, that's reflective of our commitment to seeing them get back um, in an orderly and, and efficient process as much as possible, because we know they're at higher risk. And we know that for the past year, um, their lives have not only been altered in terms of their activities and what they can do, but just that very clear fear for their safety. Uh, and so we're continuing to do that. We're already making sure that that allocation is, is reserved for those individuals 65 and older while continuing to vaccinate our uh, frontline essential workforce. Okay, well, thank you very much for sharing that information with us as well. And here's a question, I, I, I received a call, I've received a lot of calls. <laughs> and for healthcare providers, or folks that are in the healthcare profession or uh, medical uh, directors and other nurses. I had a question in reference to, can we assist to help get the vaccinations out to the people that are on the waiting list or a long list? Can they host actual yeah. vaccine events? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's two primary ways that our, our healthcare professionals are, are helping in a huge way with um, vaccine yeah. distribution in this vaccine campaign. And actually, whenever the appropriate time is, you guys let me know, we're happy to bring up some slides to these points. Um, yeah. But uh, I'll mention the two and then you guys let me know if you want slides or not. Um, so one is obviously signing up for our medical reserve corps. If, if there are folks who are sort of, sort of out of the active workforce at this point, or they feel they have extra time to give, we're using hundreds of Medical Reserve Corps volunteers uh, to administer our vaccination campaign in a number of capacities. So some of them indeed, you know, they've got the syringes, they're handling the patient interaction, um, but they're helping with registration, they're monitoring people in the re a required 15 minute observation period after each dose is administered to ensure that you know, folks are safe and that they're not having an adverse reaction. So MRC are just playing an essential role. This is across the entire country, across the whole Commonwealth, and certainly here in Richmond and Henrico. Um, and then we are lining up um, private providers, pharmacies, uh, to specialist providers to be partners for uh, distribution of vaccines. So we're ensuring they have the paperwork needed so that they can be redistributed vaccine from our public health authority. Um, and in some cases, they may be able to get what's called direct allocation uh, so that you know, they can directly receive doses um, and can get those out to priority populations working in coordination and partnership with us so that as I said, we hit those marks of making sure our 65 plus neighbors um, are getting 50% of our vaccine on an ongoing basis. So that as we continue to move through the phased approach of uh, managing the vaccine campaign that 
each of our essential worker categories, our neighbors with underlying conditions and disabilities, that they are accessing vaccine through those provider partnerships that you're asking about, Chloe. All right. I appreciate that so much, Ruth. If you would like to put up that slideshow, in addition, that's fine. We got time to do that. Yeah, I mean, we're happy to. Um, yeah, as please as do. pleases the delegation, as pleases their constituents. Yeah, I'll do that. And then maybe we can invite yeah. uh, my colleague, uh, Amy Popovich, to, to join us as we go through these slides. I'll yeah. get those brought up now. Great, thank you, Ruth. Happy to be here as well. Thanks for having me. All right, Amy, come on in. <laughs> Amy yes. is, a, is a nurse manager of the Richmond City and Henrico County Health Departments. So upon receiving her bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of Virginia, Ms. Popovich worked with VCU Health as a clinical coordinator for two years. Upon her graduation from the University of Virginia with the master's in nursing and public health in 2009, she began her career with the Henrico and Richmond Health Departments as the Resource Center Program Manager in and in 2018, she, promote, she was promoted to her current role as the nurse manager and director of community engagement. Once again, Amy, glad you're here. Thanks. Just wanted to do a double check here. Everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Great. Um, all right. Uh, we're I'm partnering here with Ruthie. So uh, we'll do, we'll share this PowerPoint slide here for the next couple of minutes. So first slide gives you an overview of our efforts here in the last two months or so um, for Richmond and Michael Health Districts. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had regional events with our neighboring districts in Chesterfield and Chickahominy uh, for vaccinations over 21,000, our own local health district um, point of dispensing events over 15,000. We, we celebrated the 15,000th dose, this 15,000th dose this week. Um, we have a mobile van that I'll uh, preview for you all in a minute, over a thousand doses. And then our partners, as Ruthie was talking about that direct allocation over 7,000 doses as well. Uh, there's additional doses that Henrico and Richmond residents have received through health system doses and long-term care as well. Those exact numbers, as Dr. Avula was showing, those are on the website too and are updated daily. Next slide. This is a vaccination timeline. There's been a lot about the um, conversation about the fact that we have a pretty low um, allocation of vaccine every week, not just at the local level, but of course at the state level as well. So I won't th read through all of this, but I think the timeline is just helpful to lay out what happened and how it happened pretty quickly where we thought there would be more doses available to us in mid-January uh, and that, uh, you know, from HHS and then pretty quickly realized that wasn't the case. And that was right around the time that we transitioned to 1B. So, you know, a lot of the um, stress and anxiety that is there because we don't have as many vaccines um, was a pretty quick turnaround that we all experienced and, and had to adjust to. Uh, a take home message for everyone to recognize is the weekly allocation for Richmond Henrico is just above 1% of the total population. So there's 560,000 residents in Richmond to Henrico and we get just above 6,000 doses a week total for our entities um, outside of some of the vaccines going to long-term care. Next slide. This, uh, as Dr. Bull was talking about, our pie chart of how we look at our vaccine. Um, you know, one of our functions of public health is to look at all of our core, you know, all of our, our pie of vaccine we receive every week and be intentional with those doses. So we do 50%, as we've said, for 65 plus, 40% for essential workers. And we actually carve out 10% for congregate care. So congregate care are facilities and entities where folks live close together and, and um, you know, then are at high risk for outbreak or for, or for having COVID. And so that includes includes our, our um, correctional facilities, our shelters, our, our group homes, recovery homes, uh, those entities. Next slide. So this is just a slide about public health's role. Um, just want folks to remember that we are still actively containing current uh, COVID cases and doing that containment work since we have been doing since March. Uh, again, uh, managing that limited support by, uh, you know, accessing vaccine, um, scaling up the redistribution and direct allocation. So both of those are kind of fancy words to talk about continuing to, to assess the best partnerships to, or in order to assist us to vaccinate our goal, our, our pie there as well. So they work with us, are vaccinating the same phases that we're vaccinating, et cetera. Um, doing a lot of these, I think the third way I'd add, you know, as Ruthie mentioned, Medical Reserve Corps and then partnerships for vaccine. A third way is doing these town halls. So we have lots of our staff who are engaging in all different types of communities um, across our city and our county to offer these kind of um, 
uh, educational opportunities, and we often go really more in depth about the vaccine to ensure folks really have a good understanding about the vaccine and, and how it works. And then of course, getting vaccine in arms. Uh, one really important uh, value of us as a health district, we've got a couple of core values. One of them is equity and an equity framework. So we looked at World Health Organization's framework and the Advisory Council of Immunization Practices, some national and some global frameworks to really um, like suss out what that practically would mean for us. So next slide. One of the alarming things that have been for us, or actually, let me do this slide and then that was the next slide. So this actually shows our um, the high rate. So we really look at who's been at highest risk for deaths mm -hmm. and at hospitalizations in COVID. And, and this has been talked a little bit about already, but one is age. We know the older you are, the highest risk you are. And we also know that race is one as well, that our African-American Latinx uh, communities have experienced higher burdens of COVID disease now, this is because of disparities that existed before the pandemic. I imagine Dr. Underwood will talk about this as well. Um, for example, higher representation in essential workforce. Next slide. Uh, so this is our race data from the, from the immunizations and the, and the COVID vaccines we've given already. 41%, um, as you see, is not reported. And so that is really, it's imperative for us to want to get that data and to have a better accurate uh, picture. But even the data we do have, of course, as, as we're seeing here on this slide, um, you know, our, our population is 42%, but only 14% receiving the vaccine in the Black community. So that is something we really want to be intentional on are working in a couple of different ways. Um, in terms of reporting for VIZ, uh, we've ensured our partners have ability to do that. We've ensured we're doing that at our events. And we actually have a, a group of folks who are calling individuals who haven't, um, who don't have that reported to offer them the opportunity to uh, tell us about those demographics so we have better data. These are our equity practices. This is what it means. You know, what does equity mean? What does having access for everyone mean? Um, yeah. For us, it means we have a health committee that meets every week to talk about um, some of the uh, situations and challenges that are going on. It means that our list and the way that when folks sign up is not a first come, first serve situation. It really is aggregated by risk, by COVID risk, as we've talked about. Uh, it means that when we go about um, vaccinating our congregate settings, uh, we do it based on level of risk of outbreaks of those who are close living situations of vulnerable populations mm -hmm. and we group them together uh, which that gives us an order of who who does first again that's not a first come first serve uh, and then vaccine determinations you know how do we determine who gets the vaccine and what uh, we have a lot of phase guidelines of course at the national level and at the state level but there are some uh, you know not everything is outlined exactly so we have a practice uh, and a small committee that kind of meets to determine what those decisions are. Next slide. All right, passing passing the mic to Ruthie. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll jump back in, and we we will try to keep our comments here brief so that we can get to the meat of yeah. um, this this session, which is the Q and A, of course. So, <laughs> Dr. Vula mentioned you know this transition. I just want to spend a moment here because I do want to reassure people who may be listening into this town hall. If you're someone who already completed one of our Richmond or Henrico uh, COVID-19 vaccine interest surveys, either as someone 65 years or older, uh, 16 to 64 with an underlying condition, or as someone who's a frontline essential worker in one of those 1A or 1B categories, you remain in the system. We're, we're going through a data migration facilitated by the Commonwealth Chief Data Officer, um, where they've requested that we take our local health district surveys down. We did that yesterday at 5 p.m. But I just want to, again, reassure you, if you already completed one of those surveys, we have your records. Um, we will not lose your records. Whatever happens in the data migration, we have uh, downloaded all records. Um, but the data migration is taking place this weekend. Um, and on Tuesday morning, the state expects to launch uh, a, a centralized single pre-registration or interest survey uh, that morning. You should be able to go to that website on Tuesday and confirm that you see your name there, that you're confirmed as in our database. So you don't have to take my word for it once uh, that database launches. You know, we're really hopeful that this will be an improvement not only for you all, which is most important um, as re residents of the Commonwealth, but also for our operations so that we can be more efficient in public health and with our provider partners. Because being able to track all of the millions, our 8 million residents in Virginia um, that you know, will qualify in ongoing phases uh, for vaccination and track them at these levels that Amy's referring to of 
you know, different broken down demographic categories and risk profiles. We have to have a database to do that. And that has been something that's lacking. So um, last point here is vax.rchd.com has been the website we've been referring people to. That will remain current. We will make sure that you get routed to the right place from vax.rchd.com. And if you're someone who prefers to talk to a real person, uh, instead of using a website, you can always call our call center. It's been operational since March and we will keep it operational so that we can assist you. Um, so some brief comments here, you know, we we're as, as we work with you, we've got a bunch of staff who are doing outreach in the community, our community health workers and our navigation and social work staff. We also have dedicated staff that are working on this vaccination campaign with each of the designated categories or populations for vaccines. So we have at least one staff person who is tasked and assigned to each population, whether that is um, our frontline essential workers in grocery stores and convenience stores, or those who uh, work in food and agriculture, or our 65 plus residents. We have multiple staff who are just assigned to working with those residents in those populations. We do a lot to make sure that we're you know, trying to be transparent. Amy talked about our sort of core values. In addition to equity and, and uh, efficiency, we really want to be transparent about this process. We know that there are a lot of questions and there's a lot of rumors going around. Um, and we, for our part in local public health, want to show you all our cards. We want you to know what our goals are and what our results are. Um, and we're, we're doing a lot in um, both from sort of one on one communications, as I mentioned, with our staff out in communities and as well sort of these larger forums like this town hall and then ongoing every Monday at 11. Uh, if you like the sound of Amy's voice, you can see her every Monday at 11 on our Facebook Live where she gives an update um, every week on our operations. All right, Amy, all right. do you want to take back over? Great. We might be changing to Wednesday, but you can still hear me every single week. Yeah. <laughs> all right, <laughs> this is a few slides. Uh, I'm, I'm learning from the best, right? Community Clovia, I'm le learning here. Um, <laughs> all right, a few pictures uh, from some of our events. Yeah, keep next slide. Um, we've got a couple of different avenues here, Arthur Ashe, Raceway, and then actually two mm -hmm. events on Southside this week and week coming. Uh, we can do several thousand at each of those events. Uh, we've mentioned pharmacy partnerships as a really important way uh, to vaccinate some of our intentional populations. Next slide. Um, our mobile van, I will show you a picture here in a second, but it is a mobile van with our nurses that drive around and are able to vac vaccinate. Um, as I mentioned, particularly our correctional facilities, our independent living facilities. Um, we had, I was at a visit this week um, at Salmonoff <laughs> Apartments in the East End. They're just able to set up and be there and it's accessible. And as residents are getting vaccinated, they see their friends and their neighbors getting vaccinated too. So it's been a really great, uh, option here. Here's the van. So it's very spacious and big. Next slide. Uh, we just received it at uh, the end of January. So we're very excited about it. Uh, safety net providers have been a really important connection uh, in the Richmond Henrico area. We have two free clinics and two federally qualified health centers, all of whom uh, have received vaccine from us and are really assisting we mentioned here Daily Planet and vaccinating the shelters in the region, uh, but additionally in vaccinating their own patients who are some of our most vulnerable. Next slide. Faith-based partnerships. Uh, this has been really important for us uh, in partnering with several different faith-based communities uh, in creating hubs at faith-based organizations around our city and our county. Uh, we've done two of those events. We've got two more next week. Uh, and I really appreciated the leadership as we know that our, our faith-based leaders are deeply rooted in communities and can be such important messengers. Next slide. Health system partnerships, uh, VCU and Bon Secours and HCA have been in close connection with us um, meeting every week. We mentioned here too, the Bon Secours Caravan uh, has assisted us in focusing on the Latinx community, um, VCU and their East End Health Hub. Uh, additionally, HCA has a clinic in Western Henrico, uh, kind of on the corner of Goochland and Western Henrico uh, for residents there as well. So great partnership with them. Next slide. Uh, here's just a, a snapshot of our vulnerable populations we've talked about. So in partnership with our safety net and our pharmacies and our own map mobile van, we've had given an opportunity at all three of our correctional facilities, all of our group homes that we know of, um, all of our homeless shelters, um, independent living facilities. This number is now closer to 13 or so independent living facilities uh, and 13 recovery homes. Mm -hmm. Next slide. All right. Thank you. That's it. End of our slide. All right. Amy, I have one quick question for you. Mm -hmm. I provide housing 
uh, for men that are returned from incarceration, transitional homes. Where do I go on your website to sign up to get them vaccinated yeah. since they are in that group with the conglomerate care? Great. Uh, I'll put in the chat the best email for us, RHHDVax. Sure. So I'll add that to the chat. And that is the best. That's an email for us if you have if folks have any questions or need to contact us. So. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. We want to get through this because we want to get to our participants involved. Dr. Janice Underwood is the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the Office of the Governor. She was appointed by Governor Ralph Northam as the Commonwealth of Virginia's first cabinet level chief diversity officer, a position that is also the first of its kind in the nation. As the Commonwealth CDO, she is committed to addressing racial, ethnic, disability, gender-based and other cultural inequities in formal and informal policies in Virginia state government. Dr. Underwood. Hey, Chloe. How are you? <laughs> I'm glad you're here. We've been talking about the numbers and whenever it comes to the situation of vaccines or when it comes to health, it's always African-American, that same language. We are disproportionately affected by this or disproportionately mm -hmm. affected by that. So is that the same in what we're seeing with the distribution with the vaccines in certain areas of our city and or our state? Yeah, well, well, thank you for the kind introduction and I'm so glad to be here and thank you. Um, for the invitation, Delegate Carr and, and all. Um, I think that's a great question. It's a complicated question because um, we the data shows for sure that um, there has been a disproportionate amount of burden in the African-American community, but also in the Latino community. And let me also be clear that um, in, in, in communities of low wealth, particularly in rural communities um, where there's a lack of uh, broadband, for example, not many hospitals in the area. And so so the other part of your question that I'd like to get into is that um, we, Dr. Abula mentioned this earlier, we also have a, um, a lack of supply. And so as that supply ramps up, I'm pleased to tell you that in the Commonwealth of Virginia, as Dr. Abula mentioned, we are now in the top 10, I believe it's top, I think our number is seventh in the nation in terms of how we've used our doses I and mean, how many people we've, we've vaccinated. Um, but we need to be vigilant, right? And so we need to not, we need, we need to not only close, think about an equitable distribution plan, which is what exactly what we've done, but also make sure we talk, talk about vaccine hesitancy. And so as Amy and Ruth spoke earlier about equity practices, which got me all excited and I thought this is fantastic, I want to encourage everyone to adopt those best equity practices. Uh, I, um, Chloe, we can't talk about um, uh, vaccine hesitancy uh, the same ways we've been talking about them. And I completely yeah. understand everyone's concern about the COVID-19 vaccination because at one time it was so partisan and politicized um, that everyone kind of didn't know where uh, to kind of think about this. We thought it was rushed, but we know now, we know the truth, we know facts. We now have national leadership that is pushing us in the right direction and really ramping up supply. But there is a justifiable mistrust in the African American community and um, the la Latino communities, our immigrant communities, uh, a mistrust by, uh, uh, about healthcare, law enforcement, government, and I get it. Uh, but I've been of the opinion that we have to change the narrative of blaming these communities for their mistrust and instead earn the trust of our communities, diverse communities, all of our residents. And sometimes earning trust also means being uh, brave enough to say, I don't know, when we truly don't have all the answers. And there's so much about the COVID-19 disease and the vaccine that we don't know. And so we can't make up alternative facts. We have to, um, we have to face, face truths, hard truths. And, and, and I'd just like to talk very quickly about what we do know. First, we do know that this is uh, not a live um, um, virus. It won't cause COVID-19. Uh, we know that the Moderna and Pfizer vac vaccines are 95% effective on adults. But what we don't know is that we don't have data available for young children or pr pregnant mothers. Uh, but, but we are getting that information and we're, we're working towards understanding more about this disease every day. 
We do know that there may be slight symptoms or a soreness in the area of injection, but these are minor and uh, in no way in comparison to the risk of death caused by COVID-19, Chloe. And there are, there are other, there's so many other factors that we all need Virginians to keep in mind, like just mitigation things. Like even if you get, even when you get the vaccine, not if, but when I'm claiming it, right? When we get the vaccine, we must continue to wear a mask and wash our hands and, and keep distance from each other, even after taking the vaccine, because we don't know if people can still pass the disease even after the vaccine. We know that our schools are, uh, for the most part, safe places. They're not super spreaders. We know that, but we also know we have to resource our schools with uh, uh, supports that, so that our kids can go back to school. We know for sure we have to take two doses at this point with Moderna and Pfizer. Um, and also the vaccine is available to everyone, including undocumented immigrants. So uh, Dr. Vula and, and the entire team, uh, we meet every day at, at seven o'clock. We're bright and early. We, uh, we work from <clears throat> sun up to sundown. And what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that the vaccine and, and support is accessible. So we've done things like tried to remove um, institutional barriers like asking people for social security numbers, asking uh, people for um, email addresses, which is why we've talked about that uh, 24 hour, seven day a week um, call, call in center. So the one last thing I'll just mention is, is I wanna tell all the viewers who are out there, get your information only from trusted public health sources like the CDC, your care provider, your Department of Health, the governor's office, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. I say this because there are already a lot of vaccine scams going on. Uh, please be on guard because there are actually folks out there that will attempt to use this moment for their personal gain, which will only further deepen the public's mistrust but I believe we're headed in the right direction. Please visit the VDH website. There's so many resources there. Yeah. We wanna encourage uh, folks out there to become an ambassador so that you can begin to spread facts mm -hmm. about this vaccine. And let me just also share with you, Chloe, mm -hmm. that our generation has never experienced both a, a global pandemic and, or what we call a twin pandemic where we're thinking about and dealing with this public health crisis, but we're also dealing about with calls for racial justice. And so the Office of uh, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and the leadership team of the Health Equity Working Group is working around the clock with the administration and the State Unified Command, public health officials like those who are on today, our General Assembly folks. And we're trying to build public trust and disseminate critical information. And we're also trying to uh, um, interrupt systems of inequity. We know COVID-19 has made uh, inequity visible to folks who apparently never saw it before. Well, we it's undeniable now and we're dealing with it head on. And there are a lot of wins coming out um, of the Commonwealth of Virginia. So uh, a special elbow bump to, to all of our legislators <laughs> who are on today because we are interrupting systems of, of inequity and really um, taking structural racism on, uh, you know, head on and, and, and we have so much more work to do, but just bl glad to be here with you. You have something else to say, Dr. Underwood? I do. I didn't know if you had another question. Um, I'm also happy to talk a little bit about the equity leadership team. Want to make sure everyone out there knows that there is a dedicated health equity working group made of so many people, um, so many diverse folks, mm -hmm. including the entire, all the state agencies in the health sector. And um, we are educating the public about testing, distributing masks and hand sanitizer and providing access to public health information and services. Really has been the cornerstone of the Health Equity Working Group. But that Health Equity Working Group, uh, Clo, is, is really made up of not only those in state agencies, but faith leaders. And I know we mentioned faith leaders before the Richmond Health District is working with faith leaders. We are as well, and we're trying to galvanize faith, diverse faith leaders across all major belief systems around the entire state. 
because we know that they have the trust of their communities. And so we're trying to partner with them. Let me also say that in the Health Equity Working Group, we have um, academics and activists and community leaders um, of all walks of life. And so it really is uh, a labor of love by folks who, who believe in uh, uh, the One Virginia mission, who believe in serving uh, the 8.5 million people in Virginia. But let me say that uh, while we started and were the first state to create a, a health equity task force and all of the states, many of the states in our nation, mm -hmm. probably about 23 have a, a version of the of a health equity task force for the COVID-19 um, pandemic. I believe Virginia is gonna be on the cutting edge because we will be the first state to codify a permanent <coughs> health equity working group as part of every future unified command during an emergency declaration. And that is a big deal. That definitely sets Virginia apart. Uh, we, we, are, we are truly understanding and believing that all the inequities that rose to the top and became visible, that we wanna make sure that communities that have been disproportionately impacted, as you mentioned early on in your question from the COVID-19 um, uh, health emergency, uh, will build resilience so that the next time, uh, the next public health emergency or the next emergency declaration where these communities have historically been disproportionately impacted by disasters will have the supports they need proactively so that we're in a better place the next time a, a disaster comes. So we have turned our work uh, from distributing masks and hand sanitizer to what we found is 66 local governments that were where our most vulnerable residents were. We have now turned our work towards creating that equitable distribution model you asked about for the COVID-19 vaccination yeah. that will help us to, to resume, uh, I don't know if you should say a normal life, but at least some sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. But we also know that we need to build back better. We need to get back to where we were and then continue to build back better. Our equity team has recently partnered to lead a series of community conversations about the COVID-19 vaccine. And I know a lot of our health districts have been doing that. And so we've been partnering with many of our health districts um, to, to bring them in, to have these conversations. You may remember our team partnering with the Massey Cancer Center and the yeah. Faith and Facts Friday group to bring Dr. Anthony Fauci to our virtual town hall in Virginia. Then a week later, we brought um, another powerhouse, Dr. Ned Sharpless, the director of NIH, to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on those with cancer. And, and I just have to tell you that um, we are working tirelessly to think about the COVID-19 vaccine distribution from not only a, a percent uh, perspective, but also a um, a number perspective. And so yeah. we're going to be thinking about mass or massive vaccination events, as well as those smaller targeted events that the Richmond Health District just talked about. It's got to be all of it. We've got to do very large events, but we also have to do targeted outreach where we use those mobile vans, where we talk to faith leaders, where we go to barber shops and, and beauty salons and community centers, where we go to where people are. We also have to think about those who are homebound and can't get to um, a vaccination event. So we're, we're, we are trying to innovate in real time, but I am, I am more than um, encouraged by the progress that we've made and where we're headed. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Chloe. All right. Well, Dr. Underwood, thank you so much for their presentation. And of course, Dr. Danny Avula and Amy and also Ruth. And now we're going to get into the question and answer period. But before we get to the participants, because we want to give them as much time as needed as possible for our panelists, we're going to, we're going to do something a little different. And what I love about it, having the legislators uh, joining us on the line, they're going to be posing questions to our special guest. So we're gonna start with you, Senator Jennifer McClellan with your question for our guest speakers. Thank you, Clovia. And these are questions that we received from our constituents. So the first one uh, comes from Janet Borges. Uh, why did Richmond and Henrico shift away from the common CDC portal 
to their own portal and how will this affect signing up for a second dose for those who have already received the first? Hi, Senator McClellan, um, this is Ruth, uh, I'll, I'll respond to that. So I believe the CDC portal that your constituent is referring to is called VAMS um, and uh, Virginia and a number of other states started using VAMS um, in December to manage the initial rollout of vaccination. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, you know, all of the registration systems that are being used across the country um, have strengths and weaknesses. Um, with VAMS, one of the main weaknesses uh, is that it requires users to create a login, um, a two-factor authentication login, um, which is really just a barrier for a lot of people. And so uh, we felt, and uh, you know, our colleagues at the state, who Dr. Vula works with now, you know, felt like this this was an important thing to be able to have a different option um, for folks because as we moved particularly past our 1A healthcare workforce that that would, wouldn't be something sustainable and it wouldn't offer that type of access um, that we need to truly vaccinate everyone in, of our neighbors that wants to be vaccinated. Um, so we've moved um, to new registration systems uh, that those also have strengths and weaknesses. And so it, I think it's fair to say that for Richmond and Henrico, our local health districts, you know, we are uh, doing everything we can to maximize the use of, of our registration options. Um, we're doing a lot on the ground to ensure that no matter which registration pathway you came through, whether it was VAMS or the new registration portal or anything that comes tomorrow, um, that your information is tracked securely um, and efficiently, that you get through your first dose and are registered for your second dose in a timely manner. Um, so we really hope that whatever the registration system is for the public, um, that it's really just you know, a couple of forms, a couple of fields that they fill out, um, and it's just a quick bridge for them to get access to vaccination and that the kind of details and inside um, um, ticky tacky uh, information around how the registration works, like that's for us to troubleshoot, that's for us to handle, and the public shouldn't, shouldn't be burdened by what those registration systems are. But we know, of course, that when they're challenging, um, that shows up for people, right? If you're trying to assist a family member or a neighbor um, to get through a complex registration system, um, you know, that, that adds something to your day, that adds stress to your day, anxiety to getting to this life-saving vaccine for your loved one. Um, so our call center continues to be operational. If you have questions as you're going through the registration process, you can call um, 205-3501 Monday through Friday during regular business hours. And we have a number of staff who are answering that line. And in addition, the state is also staffing a call center in the event that our call centers are busy. All right. You're done, Senator. Thank you so much, Ruth. Now we're gonna to go to Senator Mahashmi and her question from a constituent in her district 10. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the question that I have is, can you please explain the Federal Pharmacy Partnership and the registration process through CVS? And additionally, which CVS stores in the Richmond area or the Midlothian Chesterfield area will be offering vaccines? Uh, will CVS conform to Virginia's policies when they begin to administer vaccines to the Virginia 1B and 1C classification? I can take that one, Senator Hashmi. So um, the CBS federal, the, the retail pharmacy partnership is a federally run program where they are providing vaccine to states above and beyond our weekly state allocation. So uh, I said earlier, we have about 130,000 new doses per week coming into Virginia. Activating the retail pharmacy partnership allowed us an additional 26,000 doses per week that started yesterday. Um, CVS was the first because CVS and Walgreens were both part of the federal plan to vaccinate all of the long term care facilities or assisted living facilities and nursing homes. CVS was authorized to be the first wave of that in Virginia. Um, and there are more pharmacies coming behind that. So probably three to four weeks, Walmart, Walgreens, Publix, Giant, Safeway, a few other retail chains will all start to get phased in. Uh, and the number of doses allotted through that retail pharmacy partnership will increase. CVS announced that they were coming to Virginia with 26,000 doses, I think last Tuesday, uh, a week ago Tuesday. And 
uh, we didn't know at the time that that would be the case. We didn't know that they were going to get picked. We didn't know that how many doses they were going to bring, nor did we know the schedule that they would be given those doses, doses on. Uh, we immediately reached out to their state leadership and said, hey, here's what we're doing in Virginia. Here's who we're prioritizing. And we already have tens of thousands of people who are in line, who have pre-registered. We need you to work with us to make sure that we can get folks off of that pre-registry list uh, into your system and, and get those folks to the front of the line. We spent basically every day for about six days up until their launch time earlier this week, uh, working through technological solutions, asking for password protected access, asking if we could just give them our list to do a bulk upload into their registration system. Um, and every time, I mean, we, we even spent multiple hours on the phone with their corporate leadership and their, and their tech folks. And ultimately they just couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure out a way to uh, give us unique access based on our pre-registration, which was really, disappointing. I think both because um, because it doesn't honor the place of so many people who have been waiting for weeks on our pre-registration list, but also their access is solely through the internet. And that really creates some equity and access issues for people across the state who don't have internet or who don't have, you know, the ability to wake up at six every morning and, and uh, you know, look for appointments or don't have the ability to drive to different parts of the state because right now you can find an appointment in Abingdon, Virginia, if you're willing to drive there. And so there are really Really deep equity issues that are that are concerning to all of us. And this isn't just us in Virginia. I was on a call this past week with the National Governors Association where we heard from governors across the country who, who expressed similar frustrations about their retail pharmacy partners. Um, so my hope is that there is enough national pressure on CVS and any future pharmacies that are coming into this program to make sure that that is not an issue moving forward. Here's where CVS did come to, uh, to work with us and, and to try to, to uh, prioritize equity. One, they took our guidance on what stores uh, they would open up into. And so they sent us the list of their plans. Uh, we shared that with the local health directors. The local health director said, you know, that's not going to serve the, the, the most vulnerable in my community. Let's move this store. So there were about six or seven stores that they moved at our request. Um, and then they also agreed to do 65 and up because of the increased risk for that population. Um, they will only be taking folks who are 65 and up until we get to a point where we can open up to others. Um, so we will work now. We've already reached out to both the CDC and those other pharmacy chains that are coming on later in, in a month or so uh, to see if we can, can work through those issues before they actually start providing vaccine in Virginia. And we'll keep you all updated on how that goes. Dr. Avula, thank you so much for your comment. Now over to Delegate Betsy Carr with your question from a constituent in your district. You have to unmute your mic. <laughs> I would have learned how to do that by now. <laughs> but uh, I have a question from uh, one constituent, Ruth Twiggs, but I must say this was reflected in, in lots and lots and lots of other questions that we received. Uh, I'm 81 years old and recently pre-registered for the vaccine. Approximately what date can I and other 65 plus individuals expect to receive an appointment? I can take this one. Uh, well, we don't have an exact date, again, as we've talked about because of vaccine supply, we are using our list. We're using our list for every event that we have, um, that at least one or two each week, um, and we're aggregating that list. I get, again, it's not a first come, first serve, but it is first by age and then by race. So. Um, soon is the answer as we continue to allocate at least 50% of the doses that we have to the senior population. Uh, we know that that's not a helpful answer, um, but we are continually actively using that list uh, and we'll move so as quickly as we can. All right, thank you so much. Now on to Delegate Dolores McQuinn. Good afternoon. This has been a moment or two for me today with electricity off and electricity back on, electricity off and back on. <laughs> anyway, uh, good evening. Uh, Dr. Bull, this is the question that I want to raise uh, in reference to the discussion that's going on in the community. Is there a specific category for those with severe disabilities under the age of 65 or will we have to wait until it's available to the general population? So there are some uh, 
underlying conditions that are outlined. So if you, and I, I popped this in the, the chat earlier, I'll also pop it in the Q&A. The CDC does have a full listing of uh, conditions that do put you at increased risk and then a separate list of conditions that may put you at in increased risk. What we're doing is we're including all of those individuals into 1B and then as spots become available, there's some room for uh, clinical judgment at, at, on, on the ground. And this is really hard because there's so many different scenarios that really need to be played into risk. So for example, um, you know, if you have a 45 year old with lupus versus a 61 year old with a BMI of 41, who's at higher risk? You know, maybe there's data that can, that can that can help you tease that out, but it also depends on like, are they an essential worker, and do they live in a household of ten people? So there's no way to write a a, a like hard and fast algorithm to be able to assign risk within those groups. But there are ways that we can prioritize certain segments that we know are going to be at higher risk. So for example, this past week with uh, with DMAS, uh, the, the Medicaid program for the state of Virginia, they are culling their lists of dual eligible, so incredibly medical fragile people who are all also elderly, because we know that they're going to fit both categories of, of being older and having severe underlying conditions that put you at higher risk. And we are devising strategies in conjunction with our local health department to get those individuals and their caretakers prioritized. Um, it, similarly, you know, a health district might look at their list and try to figure out, you know, based on the underlying conditions, are there ways to be able to move up and down? Or do we just give vaccine to the cancer units at the hospital? Because we know that those individuals are going to be at higher risk. So um, it is, there's not a clear answer. There's so many dynamics as we consider the individual risk of, of different people with different underlying conditions. Um, and so we're just trying to like take each tier of the most risky uh, and, and try to prioritize them. But I'll pop that link in the, in the question and answer and in the chat again. All right, Dr. Danny Avula, thank you. Uh, Delegate uh, Bagby. If Delegate Bagby is not on, we're going to go to Delegate Jeff Bourne. Thank you, Chloe. So good yeah. to be with y'all. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I have a question. Uh, and essentially, it's uh, can my husband and I receive the vaccine on the same day? Um, essentially, can one of us request that we both get inoculated um, at one, one visit time, one visit day? They're both over 65. Um, and when they were able to register, does it indicate that one of us uh, had been skipped? How would how would a married couple over sixty five get vaccinated on the same day? Is that possible? Yeah, I can I can respond initially, Delegate Bourne. Um, so the the first thing I want to reassure your your constituent and everyone is no one will be skipped. Um, you know we're we're keeping our our data as clean and orderly as we can. Um, if, if someone is not invited to register for an event today, that doesn't mean that they won't be invited to register for an event tomorrow. Um, and as Amy outlined in our presentation, you know, we're working with regional partners um, and with private providers doing our own local public health um, point of dispensing events. So there's a number of different types of events. They all do the same thing. They all make sure people get the vaccine in a safe way. Um, but it, it's some of that kind of complication of the different sort of routes and pathways and ultimately locations where people might access the vaccine. Um, in terms of couples over 65, you know, the good news is that they're, they certainly are both eligible just by virtue of their age because we understand, you know, the elevated risk profile um, for, for both of those married people. Um, uh, the way that we're organizing our sort of working through of that that very large population, uh, as Amy described earlier, is we're not focusing exclusively on first come first serve. Um, we're working at, on a framework that prioritizes risk level and equity. So we're looking at those who are older and we're looking at those who are from demographic groups that have the highest rates of hospitalization and death um, in the Commonwealth right now. Uh, so that that means that you know for a couple maybe one of the spouses is 80 and another spouse is 71 um you know that that might mean that they're not invited at the same time to the same event because we're trying to make sure that 
the uh, sort of other 80 year olds and, and folks sort of in their cohort um, are, are also prioritized at the same time. So um, for those folks who have already been invited uh, to, to register for a public health vaccination event, if you weren't able to also register your spouse at the same time, we continue to work through our list. Um, you can call our call center or when the state pre-registration database launches, you can check that database to ensure that your spouse or your loved one is still on that list and we'll keep working through it. I can report that, you know, we, we are registering spouses in some cases. Um, it's mostly just limited to those individuals who do not have access to internet and to email that can't access these digital platforms. So when we call people to register them, and we are doing hundreds of outbound phone calls to register seniors because we know not all seniors can work through the, the internet platforms um, for registration. Um, you know, if they have a spouse, we can register them on the phone one of the limitations of our digital registration platforms, and it's one of the things that Dr. Avula and his colleagues at the state, you know, they're, they're hearing from us all the time about our request to get this fixed, um, is we're not able to send secure registration links. So that means we can't uh, share links just with another spouse because then they can get shared broadly on the internet, right? And then that's where you have the individual from many counties away that might not technically be eligible who could get access. So we're not doing that in Richmond and Henrico because we want an orderly, equitable process of vaccine distribution. Um, so for those outbound phone calls, we are often registering a spouse if, if a spouse is you know, in the household or that loved one is in the household over 65. Ruth, thank you so much. Now we're going to move on over to a question from a constituent uh, delivered or presented by Delegate Adams. Hello. Can you all hear me? I hope you can. Yeah. Um, before I um, ask my question, I will say, um, I just give a little reminder to plug in your phones. Uh, if you would, uh, your power goes off and you do not want to sit in your car for your next Zoom meeting, I would just remind you to plug in your phone. Uh, my uh, question comes from a constituent, uh, Don Peoples, and he says uh, that he registered for the vaccine using the 65 plus interest form and did not receive a confirmation call or email. He wants to know why hasn't he been contacted uh, with, with confirmation of him completing his interest form? Thank you. Hi, Delegate Adams, this is Ruth again. Um, so the good news here is that the state is gonna be sending um, sort of a, a mass mailer to everyone in that migrated, that merged database that they're building this weekend. All of our local health districts across the state have been managing our own pre-registration or interest surveys up to now. Um, and we've got large lists of our own as a result of, of those surveys, um, but we haven't had access to a mass mail tool and that is, so frustrating for your constituent, um, and it's frustrating for us. <laughs> we know that there are people waiting to hear from us, and it does not reflect well on us that we do not have an ability to email them. Um, we have asked for that tool. We have submitted a request. It was just approved on Thursday. Uh, it took some time, but we got it. So uh, we will have the ability to send out mass mailers. And as the state does this merger where they bring all of our local data and data from all 30 health districts across the state into one single place, they're also sending out an email. So your constituent, uh, Delegate Adams, and all your constituents, all of you on the phone, if you have completed one of those surveys, you will get that email in the coming days explaining the new centralized database, ex confirming that you are in it, um, which hopefully will, will bring a little bit of relief. Uh, you know, we know that this is just a nerve wracking process. You submitted a form, you were told to submit a form, you yeah. did it. Um, and then you haven't heard anything. You've heard from neighbors or friends that they got an invitation to a registration event for a vaccination. How uh, anxiety producing is that? Absolutely. Uh, and we apologize that that has been the case. It has not at all um, been up to the standards that we have for ourselves in public health, but we are fixing that. <laughs> We're doing everything in our power to fix it. Um, and in the meantime, we absolutely offer our apologies that your constituent has had to wait to get that confirmation. It, and it is coming in the coming days. If anyone has not pre-registered, I'll just reaffirm, um, you can go to vax.rchd.com and we will have the most up-to-date information there every day. Um, about where you can go to pre-register if you or a loved one has not yet done that. But most people have. We've got 
I think uh, over 100,000 people who have pre-registered with us. And, you know, just a distinction in the language here, registration is when you actually go to make an appointment for vaccination. Um, Pre-registration, as the state calls it, is what we call our interest surveys. That's essentially just raising your hand and saying, I believe I'm eligible for the following reasons, whether it's age or where you work as an essential worker, um, and, you know, just giving us your information. So slightly different processes there. All right, Ruth, thank you so much. And thank you so much for that question, uh, Delegate Adams. Now we're gonna move on over to Delegate Von Valkenberg. Hey everybody. And first I wanna thank uh, Danny, Amy and Ruth for being here because I know they haven't slept in over a year. And so uh, I wanna thank them for all their hard work and also for, for being on here on a Saturday. Uh, so my question is from, from Mary and it says, I'm receiving my second dose next week. How long after inoculation is it safe for me to spend time with my grandson? And maybe if I could broaden that out a little bit too and say, you know, once she does interact with her grandson and her son or daughter, how should she interact with others once she's had both vaccines? And by that, I mean, you know, mask wearing and that type of stuff. So if you could maybe answer the, her direct question, which is when can she see her grandson? And then maybe the broader question about kind of just general behavior. So the second one first is that uh, while we know the vaccines are incredibly effective against uh, contracting COVID and developing severe consequences of COVID, what we don't know yet is if you can still be a carrier and transmit COVID. Uh, I would suspect that probably in three months or so of being able to collect more data, we'll, we'll have a updated guidelines on that. But, but right now the recommendation is post-vaccination uh, that we're still asking people to wear masks and maintain distance while we can collect that information and be sure. I think this is going to also be really important in the context of emerging variants. You guys have un undoubtedly heard that there are new mutations, new variants that are circulating across the world. Um, we have identified two of those here in Virginia, the B117 variant, that's the United mm -hmm. Kingdom variant, and then the B1351, which is the South African variant. Um, we are looking for these. Our state lab is, is sampling about 10 to 15% of all new positives and then any new uh, clusters or outbreaks that we're seeing are being uh, sequenced, genetically sequenced to identify whether we see more of these variants. But right now, six of the UK variant and two of the South African variant. When we have watched this in other parts of the world and talked to colleagues, I was on the phone last week with uh, my counterparts in Israel. From the time that they saw their first UK variant to uh, to, to now, two months, they have seen that become 70 to 80 percent of the circulating disease in their community. Uh, and the CDC here actually anticipates, their modelers say that probably by the end of March, the UK variant will be the dominant strain here in the United States. Uh, this is concerning for a couple of reasons. It is more contagious than, than the, the other strain of COVID that we've seen. Um, but it also does appear to potentially cause more severe disease at the older a end of the age spectrum. Uh, not certain about that yet, but that is what some of the initial studies from UK have shown this past week. Um, what we do also know right now, the good news is that it appears to be transmitted the same way. So if we're doing these core things that I know we're all tired of, but, but that work, we're wearing masks, washing our hands and staying home when we're sick, uh, that is gonna limit the spread. The vaccine also appears to be very effective against the UK variant. Uh, we're still doing studies on the South African variant, but that looks, at least at this point, to be less the case. And so sorry for that long uh, diatribe, but I do think it's important that even in the context of vaccination, we're gonna have new challenges that we're facing and we've, we've still gotta be really careful moving forward. Okay, Dr. Abula and Delegate hold on, Blitz. hold on, one, one quick, real quick. So, when can she, when can she see her grand, when can she see her grandchild? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think that if if we're still following the same precautions, then tomorrow, right? But I I, I think the challenge is that kids will not be uh, eligible for vaccine likely for months. I would guess September at the earliest. Right now, uh, Pfizer is. Uh, people who are 16 and over can get the Pfizer vaccine. They are conducting trials with 12 to 15 right now. Uh, Moderna is currently recruiting for that adolescent population and starting to test at younger ages as well. But we won't have data or approved vaccine for children, I would guess, till September. Um, mm. So I think there there are safe ways to do to do meetings and and uh, to to be able to see your grandkids again. Um, but 
uh, we've still got to be careful. Wow, that's good stuff. Thank you so much. And Delegate Willett. Hey, everyone. Uh, it's, it's great to be here this afternoon. And I've been fortunate to join uh, Danny in some prior calls. And I'll say this again to Danny, Ruth, Amy. Uh, you guys are on loan to the state. This is not a permanent position. We want you back in Henrico and in Richmond. Uh, <laughs> we love what you're doing for, for the Commonwealth, but uh, you serve us well here locally, uh, too. So it, it's great to have the A-team helping uh, helping everybody. Um, there's some very generous folks in, in the, the 73rd district who are, who are interested in volunteering to help anywhere they can. And these are non-healthcare workers, so they wouldn't be part of the Medical Reserve Corps. But the, the question is, it's a two-part question. One is how can individuals, what can they do to help? And then um, organizations who have facilities, I'm thinking of churches, for example. I've had several church, uh, have several pastors ask me, hey, I've got a great facility here, do, does the state need this, does Henrico need this as a vaccination site? So individuals and organizations, how can they help? Sure, I can take that one. Uh, yes, we'll take all the help we can get. Uh, there are multiple pathways. We've mentioned the medical reserve form. Someone also could sign up to be a volunteer with the Richmond Henrico Health District. That could involve something like uh, working at our call center, for example. Uh, we've mentioned that's open five days a week. So it's a pretty simple process. I'd recommend emailing that same email address I put in the chat, the rhhdvax at bdh.virginia.gov. Uh, and and uh, thirdly, I guess, certainly um, we'll take opportunities for spaces and locations. Uh, we are tracking that right now. Uh, there are a couple of factors that go into a space location. Uh, it has to be a big indoor space, particularly for the winter. And then in the hot summer months, uh, a big open and, and tall spaces, a large parking lot, uh, accessibility from a main road, uh, and then of course, accessibility from a bus stop location, for example. So. Uh, Email again, that same email address. We'll take all the input. We'll have our team follow up. Um, and in the case that we, um, it is in a location that's helpful, we would do a site visit. So uh, certainly want to take all that information. Contacting us at our email address is the best way to do it for any folks who are interested in volunteering or who have some ideas about what spaces might be helpful. Hey, Chloe, I just wanted to add to that, sure. that in addition to um, faith leaders contacting their local departments of health, it might also be really advantageous, advantageous to contact your local emergency manager office. Um, uh, they are also taking down and, and, and doing site visits uh, as we ramp up community testing um, and testing and vaccinations. The other thing I wanna encourage everyone to do is to go to the Virginia Department of Health website, the, the state website, and anyone can sign up to be a, an, a, an ambassador, meaning some a trusted, uh, um, influential community member that can then carry uh, factual public health messages in their communities. So the ambassador program is another way that everyone can get in the game. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I'm going to do the final two questions from constituents in the 9th Senatorial District, the 72nd uh, House District, and it's from Patrick McLeod. And the question is, when does the state anticipate finishing phase 1B and beginning phase 1C? What is the proposed uh, housing, what is it proposed that housing construction employees included under 1C as essential workers? Will this include rental housing professionals, maintenance staff in particular, as these employees are required to go to people's homes, not only as part of their job, but in order to uphold requirements of the VRLTA to maintain? Um, sorry, let me make sure I heard that. So the, the beginning of that was, when do you think we're gonna be in 1C and beyond? I really right. don't think that we, uh, if, unless we see drastic increases in supply, I think we will be working through 1B, uh, likely through the end of April. So if I had to guess, I would say May and beyond is when we would get to 1C. Okay. Um, and then the question about construction workers who are currently yeah. in 1C, uh, you know, I mean, I think that if you look at every tier that is in 1B, uh, you know, I think everybody can sort of look at that, those scenarios and say, hey, why aren't we a, a, a higher on the priority list? And, um, you know, I think that the reality is that the priority list is skewed towards people who 
uh, you know, are required for some of the most most uh, essential functions of our society, right? The need to get folks back to school, childcare workers who are needed so that people can get back to work. Mm -hmm. um, and it is really hard. I mean, you really are just kind of splitting hairs as you go through each of those tiers. Mm -hmm. um, and in a practical way, I'm not sure that it matters all that much, right? Like our supply is so constrained uh, that even if we were to move people around on one C, it doesn't change the fact that we're going to be looking at may and beyond for those for those uh, for those tiers and so um you know the decisions around essential workers were made with uh, a lot of data in conjunction with federal entities and with a real eye towards racial equity um you, that's reflected when you think about uh, the you know manufacturing uh, workers or grocery store workers or bus drivers and those in frontline transit um, so, you, you know, I, there, there've been, a, there's been a lot of lobbying and, and, uh, engagement with the state on what about my group and, and yeah. the reality is that everybody who wants to get vaccinated will be able to get vaccinated. It just mean, may mean a, a couple more weeks before the mm -hmm. supply opens up as, as we get further into 1C. All right. Thank you so much for that response. And the final question, um, from Senate district 10. House District 68, and the question is from Beth Lamana. What is the legislative agenda for continuing to invest in public health after the pandemic to ensure that we do not have under-resourced public health infrastructure in future emergencies? Someone can jump in. Talk to me, respond. <laughs> I'll start with that. Um, as you may know, uh, the House and Senate each voted on their versions of the state budget last week, and um, they're about to go in the conference. And I think, um, you know, short term, we are focused on getting through the um, the pandemic and making sure that our healthcare safety nets have the resources they need to deal with um, the vaccines and testing. Um, and, and the good news is we've, we've gotten a lot of federal CARES Act funding that we have been able to use uh, for that so that we can free up some of our general fund uh, money to pay uh, a little bit more long term on the, the safety net. Um, and so the details of that are still being worked out, but um, I will put in the chat uh, a link to a summary of uh, the Senate budget and I'll defer to um, Betsy Carr and, uh, and Dolores McQuinn. They serve on the House Appropriations Committee. I serve on the Senate Finance Committee. Um, but we are all very focused on making sure that, that all of our safety nets, not just our healthcare safety nets, but our economic safety nets um, are, are rebuilt stronger coming out of this crisis and that we can do as much as we can uh, not only to meet the immediate needs of our constituents uh, through this crisis, but that we are thinking long term on how, um, you know, frankly, we're not going to recover exactly back to where we were a year ago. We know that there are lots of things that COVID has changed permanently. And so we are thinking through how do we adjust as a, as a commonwealth um, to continue to meet our constituents' needs in a post-COVID world. Um, and so we are we are definitely thinking long term on that. Right. Senator well, McClellan. So just to, oh, just you, to add, wants to jump in. I'm sorry, it's Delegate Bourne. Hey, Delegate. I, and I'm going to just be quick because I know uh, Delegate McQuinn and Delegate Carl want to talk about the budget, but I think all the, um, the health care um, pieces are, are a larger part of all the housing work that we're doing to, to continue the COVID um, protections that we put in, all the educational funding that we're using and, and, and doing. So it's a, it, it, healthcare is a broad umbrella in this context. And so yeah. I'll stop there and, and uh, allow uh, our deferred to Delegate Carr and Delegate McQueen. All right. So what we want to do real quick, we want to get to the first question from the participant, and then we can come on back to you, Delegate. Here's, here's the first question, and it's from the audience, and we really need to get to them. It's Felicia Manns. She say, I assist my 90-year-old mom and took her for her vaccine, but I was not scheduled. I am 58 with some underlying medical conditions. There are others at the racetrack transporting the elderly. Is it possible for the family provider to be vaccinated at the event? 
This is Ruth. Uh, I, I can respond initially um, to, to the question. Yeah. Uh, so I think that the key thing here is that supply is challenging for all of us um, mm -hmm. all across the country. I think that if we had more supply, um, an individual under the age of 65, such as this individual who's 58 mm -hmm. and, and says they have underlying conditions, oh, underlying. we would be able to sort of, you know, sort of mingle those two populations and have an individual with underlying conditions and an individual over 65 um, be able to be vaccinated at the same event potentially. Um, because our supply is not sufficient, you know, we're getting 1% uh, of our population uh, in vaccine doses each week. Um, and we've got, you know, about 600,000 people just, just in our local health districts that we're responsible for getting vaccinated in an ongoing way. We have to follow this phased approach. Uh, and we know that that, you know, creates logistical complications for people. And it's a real pain point um, around these, these considerations about who should go first. You know, I think the, the main thing that um, has really stood out to me is we've been answering hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of constituent inquiries um, who qualify for 1B vaccination, maybe as grocery workers or mail carriers who were not yet vaccinating in Richmond and Henrico, is that we all rely on each other. The 58-year-old relies on her mom for you know, advice and counsel. Her mom relies on her to get to that vaccine appointment. We rely on our grocery workers who rely on our educators who rely on our mail carriers, right? We're all essential at some level and the vaccine supply does not reflect that. Um, and I think if it did, we would really be able to open the gates much wider. And I, I think my colleagues, uh, Dr. Vula and Amy would probably agree, you know, this gatekeeping work is not something that we prefer to do or want to do. I think we'd really rather get out of the way and be seeing um, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people vaccinated every week in Virginia, as opposed to the just over 100,000 um, that on average we get doses for each week at this point. Um, we trust that supply will go up in the coming months, um, but months is not today. So that does put us in this position we, where we're not able to honor that 58-year-old or, or others, right? We know that a lot of you are showing up for your neighbors, whether it's your mom or someone else, you're helping your, your community um, to access this vaccine. And you know we, we will continue to open the gates as wide as we can, as wide as the supply allows. All right. All right, Ruth, thank you for that comment. Here's the next question for the panel. It's from Susie Palmer. She said, appreciate, she does appreciate the shout out to lupus patients as she's one of them, but at 65, her priority is the same as if she didn't have lupus. She said, doesn't make any sense to her, but she would appreciate the rationale with that. So she's 65 years old, she has lupus, and she's trying to figure out what is the rationale to that if she didn't have lupus and didn't have an underlying condition. I'm happy to answer. I just wanted to leave space in case one of my colleagues wanted to jump in. <laughs> I think I did get a text from uh, from Amy that she lost power um, at her home in, in the so, East End. And so I know Danny. that's where Dr. Avula lives too. Yeah, Danny lost it too. There you go. Um, well, I will represent for for VDH and Dr. Underwood. You know, feel free to for, feel free to jump in as well. Um, so, for individuals who may be over 65 who also have an underlying condition such as lupus or diabetes or a heart condition, um, they may be longtime smokers. Any one of these dozens of conditions that the CDC has put on a list of evidence-based conditions that we understand may contribute to risk. Um, you know, the the point at which sort of all 65 year olds kind of become like that gatekeeping becomes less functional is that a, over 85 percent of those over 65 have at least one of those conditions. Um, and so trying to sort of slice and dice one 66 year old with two conditions to a 69 year old with three conditions, uh, you know, it becomes less meaningful. And so our uh, goal um, at VDH and locally here in Richmond and Henrico is to allocate 50% of our weekly supply to seniors. 50% every week is our goal. Um, so if we get 6,000 doses, just over 6,000 doses every week, you know, over the course of a month, we want to see 12,000 doses be dedicated to seniors. Uh, and that's because 85% of seniors, by virtue of, you know, living a long life and hopefully having a lot of good memories along the way, you know, may have one of these conditions or more than one. Uh, so 
I think that that speaks to um, some of where that gate, gatekeeping just kind of breaks down, isn't really um, helpful to us in public health and not really helpful to the public, um, you know, having to really think about, wh well, what does my condition do versus my cousin's condition or my neighbor's condition? We want to vaccinate everyone over the age of 65. Right. And I'll just add that as we sure. think about who's most vulnerable or who's most at risk, um, we, we have really broadened that out um, because typically and historically the words at risk has been such a, um, a nebulous term that most people didn't either understand or they just lumped certain people into this stereotypically into a group that just said at risk or vulnerable. But what we know for sure and I think Ruth and Amy and, and Dr. Rula would all agree with me is that those who have typically um, uh, not viewed themselves as historically uh, at risk or vulnerable have found themselves in those categories because we have had, this pandemic has wrecked havoc on all of our lives and it's not an intellectual exercise. So to the resident that was speaking, Chloe, that, that is dealing with not only being 65 and over and having lupus, you know, we, we feel you, we see you, and, and we are here to, to, to provide as much support as we can. But it sounds like a broken record. I hate to say it again, but our supply is so limited that um, we're having to follow the best practices um, like that, that Ruth and Amy have been talking about in terms of trying not to split hairs, but understanding that uh, we're, we are literally operating and innovating in real time to get to everyone. We are leaving no one behind. We also know that there's so many people who are struggling um, because we're, it's disingenuous to say we're all in this together because there's some people that are at that that uh, that idea of some people in yachts and some people in little little teeny boats with taking on water, you know, but we have to help each other. We have to be one Virginia strong, help each other. Um, that's how we'll get through this. But um, it, it, it should go, um, it should be underscored that we hear that resident, we hear everyone, and we're working in, in real time to do, to do um, something about it. All right. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. We're going to go to the next question from our participants and thank, I want to thank them so much for being here. Is there a list somewhere what kind of health professionals are authorized to administer the vaccine in Virginia at this point? And, we're, and they're specifically wondering about dentists. There is a list. Um, trying to, it's. I'm trying to remember exactly where it is. Uh, let me let me do some looking, and I'll see if I can find it. I believe it. the list, Dr. Vula, is it listed on the Department of Health Professions website? It likely is there. I think there's also one on the VDH website that I was thinking of. But um, it it and then there is also an executive order that is in the works that would include dentists and veterinarians and dental hygienists and a couple of other categories. So let me see if I can find an answer to that and, and post it before this is over. Okay, all right. So we'll move on to the next question and then you can jump back on Dr. Avula. How do we know the vaccination works with all the medications that many of our African-American seniors may be taking? For example, heart medications, diabetic medications and more. Um, well, in, the, in general, the way that vaccines work are really dependent on your immune system and your ability to res your immune system's ability to respond to, uh, to new proteins, new threats. Um, so there's not a lot of interactions uh, in other cases between vaccines and, and, and medicines. Um, during the trials, now remember like tens of thousands of people participated in trials. So in the Moderna trial, I think that number was 36,000. Uh, in the Pfizer trials, it was about 44,000 people that participated in these trials, um, many of whom had underlying conditions and were on medications. Uh, the overall participation by African Americans in both of those trials was right under 10%, like 9.5 or so. Um, so there, these things were tested on a large scale and continue to be uh, as more and more data is collected. But, uh, you know, our best information comes from biologically how these things work. And then, uh, then the experience of, you know, 70 plus thousand people in those two trials. Okay, next question. And when will our teachers and educators be vaccinated? I know some have, but that is the question. Yeah, uh, sure. um, Amy, did you want to take this one since you're back? Yeah. Your power's back, back on? 
that was exciting. <laughs> the, the fire alarms went off too. So I'm really glad that we spared you all on that noise. Um, and for Richmond to Henrico, the uh, first part of 1D that we are open to includes K through 12, daycares, um, of course, police, Hyatt, fire, and hazmat as well. So for the Richmond Henrico, we did um, part of those regional events were for schools, um, particularly public schools, K through 12 at that regional event, along with our jurisdictional police force. So those who wanted the opportunity were able to have them. Additionally, um, Richmond Public Schools as being online, um, also had some uh, frontline workers, folks who were, um, who were driving buses and who were offering nutritional support as well. Uh, so those folks had the opportunity to have the vaccine as well. All right, so that was that one part of the question. And of course, I'm scrolling, here it is, this next part. Uh, when our teachers and educators get vaccinated, you answer that, Amy. Um, I delivered meals on wheels in other communities. Those volunteers were already inoculated because they're dealing with a vulnerable population. What about Richmond volunteers? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, based on 1A and 1B criteria, you know, we've kind of mentioned this before with vaccine supply being really low. Um, we really depend on um, where they fall. You know, we have those definitions from CISA and from VDH based on who is eligible under 1A um, and then who is eligible under 1B. Again, for Richmond Henrico, really focusing on uh, those uh, police fire hazmat K through 12 and daycares, as we mentioned, those over 65. Uh, and then those congregate settings, um, those those settings that are where folks live really close together. So that's what we're focusing on. So it would depend on where that volunteer fell in that. I think you were referring to um, food distribution. Um, so our food and agriculture actually is that fourth um, entity there on 1B as listed under the VDH website as Danny was uh, Dr. Vol pointing to earlier. Uh, so that's where that volunteer would fall, fall, fall in that fourth group. Um, as Ruthie mentioned, we have team leads for each one of those, you know, manufacturing, food and agriculture, transportation, for example, because we know those entities have a lot of questions, even though vaccine is not yet available to them. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question. Will CVS draw appointments on a first come, first serve basis or randomly through their online portal? Yeah, again, one of my many areas of heartburn with the CVS process. It is first come, first serve. They are adding new appointments pretty much on a rolling basis. So um, they've got 36 locations throughout the state, each of which are doing about 100 appointments a day. Uh, I just went on there a few minutes ago, and it looks like they're all booked. But tomorrow morning, there'll be a new slate of appointments for a few days out. So if you are 65 and over, um, it would be an effective strategy to get up early. And, and I, I think they probably open up at 530 or 6 something like that where they'll open up appointments for five or six or seven days out so uh, checking checking on that cycle is the best way to, to slot appointments at CVS. Okay next question what if you check on the website the new website and find that your data did not successfully migrate how do you get back on the list with the original place in line? Um, all right, so the question is, if, if once we do the merge this weekend, if somehow right. you are still not on the list. Right. Um, I guess, I don't know, this would be a good conversation for Ruthie and I to have about <laughs> how the, uh, like, are, you guys will still have your original list. So the local health departments will be able to confirm if people were on the initial list or not. So I think the answer to that is get in touch with your local health department um, and then figure out if, uh, if for whatever reason that didn't port over. Uh, but I, I think that the chances are pretty low, but, but in case right. it does happen, get in touch with your local health department so they can confirm when you were on the list and we can make sure that that gets integrated into the state list. All right, the questions for are those of you who are okay. You want to oh, jump in? Ruth? Sorry, no if problem. It's, if it's helpful, Chloe, um, you know, for for those who are tracking this this um, transition to the new statewide database that closely, I know many of us may not be, but for those who are, um, you know, just reassurance that for all of our vaccination events next week, we've already pulled the data before this migration started, before the sort of merger started, um, so that we could be managing invitations now um, and over the weekend and early next week. So when the new database launches, if the new database is functional from you know moment zero, from the initial uh, minute that it launches, 
we'll be using it. Um, but in the event that it goes through a hiccup for an hour or a day, um, you know, we've got all of our pre-registration interest surveys and we'll continue to work from them um, because we have, you know, over uh, 60,000 people uh, in our senior list, the 65 plus list. Um, you know, we've got a lot of people to keep working uh, to get vaccinated um, and then many thousands of people from our frontline essential worker categories, too. And that said, when the centralized system is there, you can check your status, as Danny said. We will, you know, you'll be you'll be able to enter, you know, a loved one or a neighbor who hasn't been pre-registered yet on a new singular conformed uh, form that, you know, everyone across the street is, is now will now be using the same form. I think that there's some silver lining in that. I think that this transition period, while we go to a new uniform system, will inherently have some growing pains, um, and it's on us to manage those growing pains uh, at VDH. All right. Thank you, Ruth. Is there a set day of the week that new doses are delivered? Many of the appointment, op appointment openings are dependent on supply. If we know the delivery pattern, is it more likely we can secure a, a vaccination appointment? I mean, at this stage, the list, the pre-registration list is in, is in the thousands and tens of thousands in every community. So uh, really, there won't be open appointments for people who aren't on pre-registration lists for two to three months. Um, now, that is not true for CVS, right? Because CVS is working through a completely different pathway. Um, we're going to try to make sure that other pharmacies who, who come through the Federal Retail Pharmacy Partnership aren't as well. But uh, so we'll just have to see about that. Um, but no, it won't, it won't really make a difference until likely April or May when the supply demand starts to, to, to actually meet each other. Okay, so um, this was a question in reference to the ages 16 to 64, as we talked about uh, those persons that have uh, disability and more at risk. But while I understand and respect the need to provide vaccines to those most in need, is there any place to structure the rollout for 16 to 64 healthy folks? And given the small percentage of vaccines being sent to Virginia, what is the projected timeline as a nearly 64 year old with an elderly parent who has been isolated in a nursing home outside of Virginia for over a year, I would appreciate some preference being paid to folks like myself, even though my mother has been, even though my mother has received vaccines, has received vaccines, I am still prevented from visiting her until it's safe for me to do so. Did you get that? <laughs> so there was a lot in there. Uh, yeah, so it's, okay. So in other words, you break it down for healthy people ages 16 to 64. She has a mother who's in a nursing home, who's been in a nursing home for over yeah. a year. So yeah. at this point, she's 64. She's not in that bracket that has an underlying uh, issue. She's not going to be able to see her mom basically until, or if she had an underlying issue at 64, where she could take the vaccine. So what does she do? Yeah, I mean, at this point, if you're 16 to 64 and healthy, uh, regardless of kind of those other circumstances, you're gonna fall into phase two. Um, and, you know, I suspect that as overall supply increases, which again, I think will happen in April. And, and let me maybe just talk about that real quick. Um, so the way that supply is increasing is happening through kind of two primary streams. One, the increased production between Moderna and Pfizer. The federal government mm -hmm. has continued to buy more doses. They're continuing to help those companies build more manufacturing infrastructure. Um, and, and Moderna and Pfizer are just able to make more and more as we go. Um, two is the entry of new vaccines into this mix, right? So Johnson & Johnson has already submitted for their FDA authorization. Uh, that decision is set to be made on February 26th. And if they are approved, if the FDA is uh, convinced of both the, the safety and the efficacy of that, we could see more Johnson & Johnson coming in that first week of March. Uh, AstraZeneca, which is already being used in many, many countries across the world, uh, is finishing up its US clinical trials. And so likely end of March, early April, we would see AstraZeneca and 
into the market as well. And then Novavax is pretty close as well. So I think the, the, the way that we're going to see more supply is through more production from Moderna Pfizer, new entries into the market, and that's going to really shift the supply demand curve. And my guess is that we're going to be plugging through 1B uh, mm -hmm. through March and April, but at some point in April, things will open up enough that we, we, we're not going to have to be as fixed about, uh, you know, the different tiers in 1C and beyond, but it really ultimately will just depend on supply. All right. Thank you, Dr. Abula. Can you provide the written plan to the public to cover the vaccination plan for the next year? I'm looking for the complete details, calculations, IT tools to be utilized, staffing resources to be mobilized, locations for all vaccination sites throughout Virginia, et cetera. Where can I find detailed written plans? Yeah, I don't think that detailed written plan exists. If so, I would know about it. Um, it's ever I mean, changing, it, huh? It, it changes every week, right? I mean, we get new information about how much vaccine is made available to, to us literally days before it comes. And so mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of things that we're doing. In fact, on the, on the phone this morning, uh, I was with the modeling team out of ODU called VD Mask. We're looking at what data streams need to feed uh, mm -hmm. future modeling to, to try to figure out, you know, if we expect expect uh, if we expect supply to increase as a, at a certain rate, uh, when does that mean we can open up to new phases? Mm -hmm. that, what does it mean about the capacity of vaccination that exists in our community? Are we really going to need these fixed mass vaccination sites or will supply really not come until the point where, where demand uh, starts to tail off? So we are working through all these modeling, but there's no written plan that could predict all of that at this point. And Chloe, the other thing I'll yes. just mention is that the, Dr. the Department of Emergency Management, they are really in the process of working with the 35 health districts and, and um, all the local emergency managers in the local cities to identify possible sites. And so when all of those are identified and, um, and, and there will be, you know, maybe state run sites, there'll be federal sites, there'll be community sites. And so all of that will be made um, public, but to Danny, to Danny's point, there is no like plan that exists right now, but that, yeah. that is all in the works while, while we're ramping up supply. Mm -hmm. Because as he's been saying, mm -hmm. we've been saying everyone, Ruth, Amy, we've all been saying supply is so limited, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be planning for that. So all of those mm -hmm. calls that we're doing, all of those, all the working, um, it, you know, behind the scenes through the midnight hour um, is really because we're preparing for when those uh, vaccine supplies uh, ramp up so that when they do, we can just hit the ground running because we've done the work beforehand. And okay. Kobe, if I may, I can yeah. just sure. Sure. different sure, components um, for what it will look like for Richmond and Rico Health District. Uh, we have four types of events um, that we'll be able to use based on vaccine supply. One is our regional events that we've talked about in conjunction with Chickahominy and Chesterfield, where we're able to have a large volume of the population get vaccinated depending on how much vaccine we have. That'll be our large massive events, for example, at the Richmond Raceway. A second, our sort of large size events are our point of dispensing events that can do 1,000 to 2,000 folks a day, really focused it on target populations. Uh, then we'll have medium sized events that can go in communities and vaccinate between 200 and 500 individuals, a really intentional sites. Of course, there was a question based on, can you use my spot? You know, is mine a good spot? Uh, we really will have a team that's already planning to be able to, to be a little bit more accessible in our communities. And then we have our mobile van, you know, the 100 or so events, but can really be focused on those communities like independent living facilities. Um, additionally, we've talked about our partnerships but at, at this point, we're already up to 20, 20 specialty clinics, um, uh, uh, urgent care centers, primary care centers, health systems, pharmacies. I imagine that list will only continue to grow of entities that it can take several hundred doses a week and really know their populations. They know their patient panels. They know who is that uh, has those underlying conditions and who would be at greatest risk for COVID. So we, we've got those plans. Um, we're ready to implement what we need as vaccine. All right. Well, thank you so much, Amy. How are folks with no internet, no phone being registered? Yeah, I can speak to that. Uh, our call center, actually we have two. We have a call center and then we have a phone bank of folks making outgoing calls. So mm -hmm. they're a separate dedicated team that are just doing that, making the outgoing calls 
So for individuals who have filled out our interest form, and we know sometimes we have a we have a box, and so I'm not sure what this will look like with the new system, but for someone to check, you know, I'm registering someone else that's not myself. So of course a caregiver oh, okay. or a family member who might not, but they can just put that person's phone number. So then we're able to follow up directly with that individual with a phone call if there's not an email listed. So email address is not required to be able to receive an appointment. Um, that that uh, call center, excuse me, that outgoing phone bank uh, mm -hmm. that I mentioned is doing between 100 and 150 calls a day to those individuals to ensure they have access to an appointment as well. Okay. Since the vaccine is in short supply, would it be possible to have a lab at MCV be contracted to produce the vaccine locally? Um, not really an option. I mean, Moderna and Pfizer are, are driving how production happens. Obviously, the federal government is trying every way they possibly can to increase production. And so they've invested a lot of money to make that happen. But uh, yeah, it's it's not it's not it's up to Moderna and Pfizer ultimately where 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 can produce that vaccine and who has the right technology to do it. All right. As more vaccines get approval, will it will it be able will we be able to choose which vaccines we receive? Uh, maybe at some point. I mean, right now, uh, Moderna and Pfizer, like, they're just really being distributed largely on logistics, right? So the, the Pfizer vaccine requires negative 90 degree uh, storage. And so um, there are only so many places that can do that. Right now, a lot of hospitals, health systems, and health departments have been able to do that. So that's the primary driver of where Moderna and Pfizer goes. Um, as Johnson and Johnson and AstraZeneca come on, you know, I think there there may be some options, particularly because Johnson and Johnson uh, is a one dose vaccine, and some what some people may prefer that. But it is less effective uh, for catching COVID. So where Moderna and Pfizer with two doses are ninety five percent, J and J is about sixty six percent effective. But they are all a hundred percent effective against death from COVID. And so you know, there, there's some nuance to that. We're currently soliciting community input through our vaccine advisory work group on, on how we should use the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, our Virginia Disaster Med Medical Advisory Committee has made a recommendation or, or I guess just submitted a recommendation this week. Um, and then we'll decide how the J&J &J vaccine based on those two bodies of guidance and then any federal guidance that comes from uh, the ACIP Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, there will be... Uh, I, it's it's tough because when supply is so limited, uh, I, I, there there won't be a ton of choice. But you'll we'll try to make it uh, known what vaccine is being given, given some of the differences with J and J and the others. Okay, since people age eighty who have pre-registered have not been contacted, and others younger have, what are the priorities for contacting people? Yeah, I can explain that, Chloe. Um, this is Ruth. So uh, for the first thing to say is that um, for Richmond and Henrico, we sort of have a framework that's based on equity and risk level that I'll describe in a moment. Um, but important to clarify that other local health districts, whether it's Blue Ridge, um, you know, sort of further to our west in the Charlottesville area or Hampton and Tidewater um, to our east or anywhere around the state, they may be using different frameworks. You know, I understand other health districts are working from a first come first serve kind of mm -hmm. um, first one to fill out the form um, sort of process. Um, for our local health districts, that's one of the least important aspects of our criteria. It's not irrelevant. We don't um, uh, get rid of that, that piece of information about when someone filled out the form, but it's at the bottom of our, our list of what we consider um, in large part because we know not everyone learned about our survey at the same time. Uh, because there are different surveys out there um, that will be conforming to one single survey next week. But up to now, there have been different ones. And some people just plain don't have access, whether it's to Wi-Fi and Internet. A lot of our public libraries are closed right now. So if you used to go to a place like a public library to get your, your Internet access, you can't necessarily do that now. So for us, it's much more important to prioritize other factors. So if someone's with those access barriers um, to filling out a form, in addition to others, um, may not have filled it out right away. What we're taking into account are the data-driven uh, uh, information about what actually contributes to risk. What is driving people being hospitalized at the highest rates? 
and dying from this disease at the highest rates. Um, and so our framework takes into account three things. Um, one is the age of the person. We know that you know, folks of, of higher ages, so yes, 65 and over, but particularly at the higher end of, of our lifespan, um, uh, they, they are being hospitalized in greater numbers and dying in greater numbers. Um, second is race. Um, individuals from our African-American and Black communities, from our Latinx and Hispanic communities, and from our Native American um, First Nation communities um, are also being hospitalized and dying in much higher proportions um, than the rest of our neighbors. Um, and then the third factor is uh, sort of zip code. We know that certain zip codes have higher levels of disease burden. So there are higher rates uh, of your neighbors in certain zip codes uh, that have contracted this disease um, and and have been exposed and by nature of uh, maybe the work that they do and of course all of this you know comes through patterns right these are these are long lived generations long legacies of structural racism um, that means that individuals in certain parts of our communities um, and and those individuals that come from Black African American Latinx and Native American heritage. Um, have these higher disease burdens and these worse outcomes. Um, so anyone who fills out our interest form, um, we're ensuring that we work through that list in a rigorous way so no one will be left behind. Um, and if you happen to fill out that interest form as an 80 year old who may be of one of those backgrounds, so you are at the higher uh, level of age, you are from one of those higher uh, disease, disease burdened communities or demographic profiles, and you still haven't heard from us, it may have to do with that very last thing of the timestamp, the date at which you completed the survey. So I know I said that that's the least important, but it may be an explanation for why you haven't um, gotten word from us. If you are concerned about where you are in your system, two things in our system, two things you can do. Um, one is call our, our call center at 205-3501, Monday through Friday during regular business hours. Um, and the second is you can check the statewide pre-registration database starting Tuesday to confirm that you are in the system. And if you're in the system, we're working to get to you, uh, as Amy said, you know, thousands of people um, every week that we're vaccinating and 50 percent of our supply going to seniors. All right, Ruth, I want to thank all of our special guests for joining us, Dr. Danny Avula, Amy Popovich, Dr. Janice Underwood, and all of our senators and our delegates in our state legislature for being here. But we're going to wrap it up, and we want to thank all of our participants for joining us. We thank you for your wealth of questions, and you can go in the chat. Dr. Danny Avula has been really, really great responding to questions as well. I am Clovia Lawrence, and it was such an honor to be here to get more questions, especially with the constituents and the participants participating this evening for the Central Virginia COVID-19 Vaccine Town Hall. So once again, I thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this. Now I have a wealth of information to take back to the community. So Delegate Betsy Carr, come on over and you wrap us up. And I, again, thank you so much for inviting me to moderate this great town hall. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kobe. You've done a fantastic job as always. I, I think you, you the key thing for making this so successful and making everybody's voices heard. Uh, and to that note, if somebody doesn't didn't have a question answered, please stay in touch with your representatives and we will try to give you that extra information. I just want to uh, also uh, affirm the thank yous of uh, Dr. Danny for being here, taking time out of your busy schedule, and Ruth and Amy, thank you for your wonderful information and and staying on top of this. I know that you're very busy every day and we really appreciate uh, all the information and the time that you've given us. Uh, and again, thank you, Nicolavia, for what you've done for us. Today. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Dr. Underwood, thank you so much for being here. It's so important to hear your voice and we so appreciate the work that you're doing uh, to, to make sure that our black and, black and brown communities, our diverse communities, all of uh, that as we move into this whole thing of, of kind of trying to get at this systemic racism, that you're a key part of that and doing the lead, particularly on this health right now. But we're so happy to have you with us and thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. Everyone stay safe and we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you on the road. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you all. Thank you.